want to start by giving you my version of what non-duality is. This is just my version, but we hear, we hear the word a lot. And as I go around, I hear people say, oh, non-duality, that means everything is one and the world is an illusion. Or other people say, oh, it means there's no polarities, there's no positive, negative, we have to get beyond that, we have to get beyond male, female, all that stuff. I see non-duality as it's not really about that. The word is a translation of the Sanskrit Advaita, which literally means not two. And it goes way back to really 3,000 years ago to Vedanta, sort of the earliest, really the earliest teachings we have on the planet. And the best introduction that I know of it in that tradition is in the Upanishads, which is really the beginning of Vedanta. And in one of the Upanishads, the Chandogya Upanishad, a father sends his son off to school. His son is 12 years old, and he says, you must go and study with the Rishis and the Vedic scholars. And the son goes off for 12 years and comes back really full of it. You know, he knows all about the stars and astrology and the herbs and the medicine and the rituals and all that stuff. And his father says, well, did they teach you about that which cannot be seen, cannot be heard, and cannot be known, yet without which nothing can be seen, heard, or known? And the son says, no. What's that? And he says, surely, if they'd known about it, they would have taught me. Can you tell me, sir? Very reverent in those days. So his father starts this long teaching. And right at the beginning of the teaching, he says, you see these two pots made of clay. They're clearly very different pots. There's a duality here. The pots are real. And they're each made of clay. The essence is the same. And the pots wouldn't exist without the clay. They're totally dependent upon the clay for their existence. And yet what we see is the pots, their shape, their size, their color. The clay, on the other hand, is always there, the essence and it's completely untouched, it's untainted by the potness. The pot can be this or that, it can be this color, it can be broken. The clay is always the same. And he says, you know, by knowing the essence of clay, you know the essence of all things made of clay. And then the teaching goes on and he says, you know, know your own essence. When you know your own essence, then you know the essence of all things. And there's the famous line at the end of each of these passages where he says, that that being, which is the subtlest level of everything, that art thou, tat tvam asi. And that's where that line, which Deepak was referring to last night, it comes from that Upanishad, tat tvam asi, that art thou. So he's saying, know your own essence, and you know the essence of everything. And what he's really pointing to is, we, we, live, in, we live in duality. And that's real. Well, I prefer the word diversity to duality. Duality implies sort of one or the other. We live in a diversity of real experiences. You know, this is real. We can't doubt this is real to say, oh, it's all an illusion. No, this is the reality we live in. Uh, experiences, the thoughts we have, whatever thoughts you're having now, that they're real, they're real, they exist. And they have no independent existence. They only exist because of an underlying essence which we don't normally notice because we're so caught up on what we're experiencing, what we're thinking, what we're feeling. We don't notice the essence. So what he was saying is there's an essence there and by knowing that essence, you know the essence of everything you experience. So, so that, that's really what I see non-duality as saying. It's not that the duality is an illusion, whatever, is saying there is this real world and we miss the fact there is also an underlying essence. And the question is, what is that essence? And it's interesting because he never defines the essence. He says, look within, explore yourself and you will discover it. But he doesn't give it a name, which is true in many mystical traditions. They say, this essence, it cannot be given a name, it cannot be defined, and yet it is so familiar, we all know it so well, and by 
inquiring within, we can begin to discover for ourselves what that essence is. We tend, in these circles, to give it the name consciousness. I think that can be misleading. Firstly, consciousness is a noun. It makes it a thing, and we start looking for something, and the whole science of consciousness is trying to describe something called consciousness. What is consciousness? Where does it come from, etc.? We're not really talking about a thing. When you add N-E-S-S to a word, you're taking an adjective and turning it into a noun so that we can talk about it. And it means the state, ness means the state or quality of being conscious, which is what we all absolutely know for sure is the fact we are conscious, we are experiencing. And that just needs pointing out, really. It doesn't need any great long arguments or anything. But we can, def we can actually divide non-duality into two areas. There's, there's the philosophy of non-duality, and there's many, many non-dual philosophies. You know, we, there's non-dual philosophies in Indian traditions, in Buddhist traditions, in Sufi traditions, in Christian traditions. In this tradition, there's a rising now in the 21st century, a whole new spiritual tradition. There's non-dual philosophies, which are all sort of pointing to the fact in one way or another that there is just, there is an essence that we don't know. They're all pointing to it and saying that this is the essence of everything. The problem with non-dual philosophies is we get, our intellects get engaged, like which one is right, or you know, which one has limitations, is my one the right one? They're all constructs, as Deepak was talking about last night, you know, and everything Deepak was talking about was a construct. All non-dual philosophies, they're all just more constructs in the mind, and we start getting into debates and arguments. I, mean, I happen to feel pretty sympathetic to Deepak's construct, but that's just because my construct resonates with his. But they're all just constructs, and we can debate them till the cows come home. But what the teachers are really talking about is what is the path to experiencing that? to actually tasting that essence, the path to it. And that's what I'm really more interested in because it's really about how do we wake up to this in our own life. The philosophies can be, they can be great, they can be inspiring, they can be frustrating at times, but they can be inspiring to help us find a path, to follow a path, to wake up to this essence. But in the end, it's like, how do we, each of us, in our own lives, begin to, yeah, let's say wake up, to rediscover this for ourselves? Because that's what it's really about, and that's what changes our lives. And somewhat ironically, most, many non-dual teachers will point out there is no path. That's another sort of characteristic of non-dual teachings. They say there is no path to this. By which they mean there's nowhere to get to. Uh, one of my favorite lines is from a Buddhist teacher who said, there's nowhere to, go, nowhere to go, nothing to do, no one to be. There's nowhere to go. We're not trying to reach some exalted, marvelous, exotic, state where everything's transformed and we see the world differently. I used to think that way when I first got involved in all this. I thought, oh, it's going to be like some amazing trip or something and everything's going to be, wow. There's no different state we're trying to get to, which means the second line is there's nothing we need to do because we're not trying to be something else, get somewhere else. In fact, the doing is actually what gets in the way. And so many teachings talking about stepping back, uh, doing less and less, to begin to notice what is already there. And there's no one to be. So much of the time you say, I am this, I am that, and I am Peter Russell, whatever it is, I am meditating, etc. 
It's letting go of all those identities and coming back to discovering really the essence is what is it we truly are. J.P. Sears last night was pointing out jokingly about that question, who am I? Which is one of the, sort of the essential questions of the non-dual path. That's the way Ramana Maharshi phrased it, who am I? That inner exploration. The problem with that question is it's, it's very deceptive. It leads us off in a wrong direction. Because as soon as you say, who am I to anybody, you do this in exercises, you know, you, you put people down, you put them in pairs and say, you know, explore the question, who are you? And people say, oh, I am this, I am that. And they go on for hours. <laughs> there used to be, in the 80s, there was this very popular workshop called the Enlightenment Intensive, where you sat down for a weekend saying, who am I? It's, I am, no, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this, I'm not that. I'm this, no, I'm not this, and I'm not that. <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, the mind lets go, and people go, ah, oh, it's just this. It's just this, this meanness, this sense of being. You cannot define it. As soon as you ask, who am I, you're off in the wrong direction, because you're looking for something, some object, some experience you can identify with. The, the word identify means, it comes from the Latin, it means to make the same as. If you're making yourself the same as something, then it's clearly not what you are. So the question, I mean, I prefer to put the question, what am I? Or what, what, what does the word I, what is the word I actually point to when we use the word I? And that's an, that's an inner exploration, inner inquiry of what do we actually mean by I? And as you know, most of you know, as you do this exploration, what you're coming in touch with is that sense of being, presence, meanness, of being conscious, that's always there, that's the same sense of I-ness that's always present. It's the same sense of I-ness that was there when you were a child. Our experiences, our personalities, our philosophies, our lives have changed, but that sense of that core sense of me doesn't change. It's always there. And that's what they're pointing to is recognizing that, that sense of self. But we don't normally recognize it because the mind is so full, particularly our Western minds, so full of thinking and we get caught up in our thoughts and follow our thoughts because most of them seem really important. They're things we've got to do, things we've got to work out, things that, you know, things I might need to take care of if something happens or whatever. In fact, most of our thoughts, if you look at them, they're trying to solve problems which don't actually exist and probably never will exist. I think it was Mark Twain who said something to the effect of, my life has been full of disasters, most of which never happened. <laughs> but, you know, watch your own thoughts. Those who meditate, probably this is quite familiar, just how easily we get caught up in some story, thinking about something and our attention is totally absorbed in some imagined reality. And this imagined reality, we have an imagined self that's going through the world, facing these obstacles, these successes the, and these challenges. There's this whole story we imagine about ourselves getting through the world and trying to solve the problems. We live in this sort of whirlpool of thoughts. And that's why so many traditions point to letting the mind become still, letting the mind stop. And I say letting, that's, that's very important. Because I think one of the misunderstandings is you've got to stop the mind, you've got to control the mind. It's more just learning the skill of allowing the mind to pause and just noticing what's there when you pause. Another great teaching, Indian teaching on this, many of you are probably familiar with the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Where it was really, it's not about physical yoga as so much as it includes that, but it's really about the whole philosophy of yoga, which is the word yoga means oneness or joining, coming together. 
Again, I don't see it means attaining something as it's sometimes understood, but you know, oneness to me is the end of separation. It's coming back to our own oneness. And the first line, the very famous first line, which is almost <laughs> every yoga school has it somewhere. Yoga is the ceasing of the whirling of mind stuff. Yoga is the ceasing of the whirling of mind stuff. You go back to 19th century translations and it's all about, we've got to stop it. We've got to stop the whirling of mind stuff. And then you watch the translations. They go through the 20th century. They get softer and softer. Oh, it's, it's allowing it to cease. Or it's just a statement. When the whirling of mind stuff ceases, then the separation ends. And then even deeper, the word that's translated as ceasing also has the meaning of freedom. It's freedom from the whirling of mind stuff. And then the second line, people just go for the first line and think that's great. And then they, the second line is really interesting. It says, then, when the whirling of mind stuff ceases, then there is abiding in the true nature of the knower. That's how we come back to knowing our essence. When the, the whirling of the mind stuff ceases, then the true nature of that which knows all things, the true nature of that which knows what can be seen, heard, and known, then that starts becoming apparent. But again, not as some amazing cosmic experience, but just as, ah, it's that simple. And I think in my own, my own journey, it's just like almost year by year, it's like, oh, it's that simple. Oh, it's that easy. Oh, it's that obvious. How could I have missed it? I think we miss it because our minds get engaged in looking for something. One of my favorite personal aphorisms is, seek and ye shall not find. <laughs> because the very attitude of seeking is looking for something else. And the very attitude of seeking, there's a tension that comes into the mind. The mind becomes slightly focused. You're looking for something. The mind becomes tense, which is the opposite to just letting the mind totally relax. It's giving up seeking. It's, it's letting go. It's just, I mean, just now, Wherever your mind is, wherever you're going, whatever you're thinking, you could be in a complete, you could be imagining something different, not listening to me, but I hope you hear this little bit. Wherever you are, just, let, just pause. We can always just pause our thinking for a moment. Just pause and just let the mind relax. Just let the attention relax. The thinking comes back within a minute or two, second or two. But in that pausing, we just begin to touch something. And when I ask people what it is, I won't do it now, but the sort of things that come up is like, oh, there's a sense of ease, a greater sense of stillness, a sense of spaciousness, a sense of clarity, a sense of contentment, a sense of lightness of being. These are all the qualities that we begin to touch into when we step back into our true nature. So I'd like to just leave you that as a, what I call a micro meditation. You know, there's big meditations we can do, hour long. So there's mini meditations you can do, it's like sitting down for two or three minutes and just stopping. Then there's micro meditations where you can just pause for a moment and just notice how it is when you just pause and just reconnect with that essence, which as the Upanishad say is the essence of all beings. Thank you.